I will be talking about the principle of 1G analog model applied in structural geology and tectonics. So, here is our topic. There are several approaches of studying the deformed rocks. One is one can do field work and if there is any doubt with the deformation, we want to cross check. So, there is another approach of looking at structural geology is through optical microscope or if I put it inside bracket optical microscopy. the deformation that are ambiguous can be cross checked under an optical microscope or even under using a microscope which has a much higher resolution. We can have a third approach and here comes the analog model which is the topic today and I can think of a fourth approach let us say the numerical models. I already told you about the field work and its purpose optical microscopy in structural geology. The purpose of the models in the laboratory or in the computer screen will be to simulate the deformation, which is not possible in field work which is not possible in optical microscopy. Simulation of deformation is possible through numerical models and analog models. What happens in a numerical model? We can have the differential equations suitable to describe a ductile deformation and we can work further and then the software can give us the simulation progressive deformation of the body with time how the body is deforming. On the other hand, the analog model involves no software, it involves soft deformable material we deformed in a control rate in the laboratory and we see how it is deforming with time. Naturally, the progressive deformation found in analog model and in the numerical model will not be possible to see in field work, will not be possible to do in optical microscopy. Instead, what we see in these two cases is the final product. Only the final product that is deformed rocks, deformation is seen, but how it has happened with time only these two means will be helpful to us. This analog modeling just now I told you involves, if I write in a very beginner's language, deformation of soft material as rock analog. at a controlled way. This controlled way means we have some machines, some instruments with which we can measure the deformation rate and we have full control on the deformation. It is not that I take a piece of clay and I press with my hand and I say that a fold is produced. In that case, it is not controlled and also it is not well constrained. Whereas in a machine, we can work out with what rate we are compressing the layers. 
So, that is the meaning what I say here as the controlled way. Now, the analog model materials can be various and in fact, it can be any soft deformable material, any soft deformable. So, I am not going to write what they are, but I can speak out the deformable material which is soft can be clay, it can be even Cadbury, even chocolates, peach, it can be bouncing putty, silicon putty, it can be the polydimethyciloxane in short which is called PDMS which is an organic compound with long chain of carbon and hydrogen which is soft and deformable suitable to deform in the laboratory. So, you can also experiment with new soft deformable material and if we know the material property which we will see slowly, then such material will be useful to run the analog model. The kind of analog model that I am talking here today is all about the ductile deformation. Again, you can look at the deformation of rocks in three ways. The ductile deformation where the rock does not break into two pieces, rather it deforms, but there is no rupture. Let us say I take a piece of clay and keep on pulling, what will happen? The clay will not rupture in the initial stage and it is can be called as a ductile deformation. But if this pulling is prolonged, what will happen? At some stage it will snap. So, that is a brittle deformation. Another way of looking at brittle deformation is that take a biscuit and break it. So, there is a material line of breakage, two pieces separately come out in your two hands. That is a brittle deformation. Any deformation which is in between ductile and brittle, partly ductile, partly brittle, we can call it a brittle ductile deformation. So, today in this analog modeling class, I am going to specify, specifically talk about the ductile deformation and what are the principles involved within it. Why not we take the real hard rock for the analog modeling? The answer is the real hard rock will be very difficult to deform. It will require high pressure, high temperature and some specific fluid activity, but it is certainly difficult, it is certainly expensive. Instead of taking a real hard rock, it is a piece of nice and trying to deform, I take a soft deformable material, then at a much slower amount of stress, I can deform it and then I can make a one to one comparison between the real deformed rock and the laboratory simulation. So, that is the purpose and the advantage of the analog modeling where we are using the rock analogs and not the real rocks. As we will see, the models that I am going to describe will be done in the laboratory where the acceleration due to gravity g is same as what is in the nature. This g is the acceleration due to gravity and we know the value is 981 centimeter per second square. In the laboratory experiments, the things that I am going to describe today, this small g value does not change, it is maintained constant. For example, if I do any experiment here, in the normal condition, it is done under 1 g condition. So, what does it mean that there are analog models where there are 2 g, 3 g cases? The answer is yes. Sometimes we use a centrifuge model, we rotate the deforming body with a certain speed and it generates the higher g value. So, I am not talking about the centrifuge model even. We have to understand from where the principle is coming. The principle that I am going to write comes from pi theorem which is there in fluid mechanics. So, this as I stated comes from Now, for the geology students for whom primarily I am making this presentation, uh, some elementary ideas of fluid mechanics is required. What is a fluid? A fluid is one, a material which flows. And as we know, fluids have no definite shape depending on the container, whatever is the shape of the container, it can attain the shape of the container. 
these fluids can have different physical properties, different rheological properties. We can have different constitutive equations. Certain fluids follow this relationship, stress is proportional to strain rate. What is sigma here? Sigma is stress. What is stress? It is force per unit area. Epsilon is some parameter of strain and epsilon dot means change in strain with change in time. You can write as d epsilon dt, you can also write it as del epsilon del t if you want. And there is a proportional relation for some fluid this is the constitutive equation and we call such fluids as Newtonian viscous fluid. On the other hand, there are a number of fluids where this simple relationship does not hold true. When the relationship does not hold true, some simple proportionality relation is very easy to write down what is called as the power relation as sigma is proportional to epsilon dot to the power n. Since for n equal to 1 for certain fluids the property is not the, the, the equation does not match with the reality. So, so, we put there n through experiments we can find out the value of n or the range of n values. In some books you will find their writing like this. So, here n can be called as a strain exponent, m can be called as a stress exponent. For rocks there are certain range of values for specific rock types. So, these fluids can be called as non-Newtonian fluids and of course, n not equal to 1 or I can write here m not equal to 1 because if they were 1 it would have come back to the Newtonian viscous fluid case. And since we have put a power and approximated the equation, we can call them also as power law equation or simply power law. Okay. Now, we take a very specific case of the Newtonian viscous fluid and from here, we can easily write down mu is a proportionality constant, we can call it the dynamic viscosity or simply the viscosity. We call it or simply If required and indeed sometimes what we do is mu divided by the density of the fluid we call as the kinematic viscosity. But we are not going to use it here, I just thought of writing down We are not getting into the non-Newtonian fluid case. What is the physical significance of this mu? The viscosity is also called the internal friction of the fluid. We can call this viscosity as internal friction. What does it mean? Let us say on this surface I have put a drop of honey and this honey will have a natural tendency to flow down. Now, there are two resistance that are working. Honey's internal friction or the honey's viscosity. Second is the external friction what you have studied in school as simply friction between the honey 
and the surface. So, internal friction is the internal property of the fluid. So, we wrote just now the equation for the Newtonian viscous fluid, we wrote the equation for the non Newtonian fluid and I may write down in this connection the rheological equation for the solids which we know stress proportional to strain and so this is for the solid, this is for the non Newtonian fluid, this is for the Newtonian fluid. And we know from here that stress is equal to we can write Young's modulus as the proportionality constant and then strain multiplied. Just for a comparison between the three properties in one place. In this presentation, first I will talk about the different principles of analog modeling and after this goes over, I will tell you what happens if the principles are not followed, if the dynamic scaling is not followed in the uh, experiments. Okay, so, one aspect of viscosity is defined and now the second thing which will be required is the concept of Reynolds number. There is a tube through which a fluid is flowing. The fluid has a velocity v, the diameter of the tube is d and the fluid which is flowing is having a viscosity mu. The word mu is coming, the viscosity term is coming here. So, here the Reynolds number is defined as rho v d divided by mu and here rho is the density of the fluid that is flowing, a single fluid we have considered. Now, if we put the dense, the unit of density, the unit of velocity, the unit of diameter length and the unit of viscosity, we will find that Reynolds number turns out to be unitless. What is the purpose of having Re? This number is very crucial. Reynolds number is less than 1, this means it is a laminar flow. If the Reynolds number lies between 1 to 10, this means it is a transitional type flow. And if the Reynolds number exceeds 10, it is a turbulent flow. Now, we have to understand what is a laminar flow, very simple slow flow is taking place and the flow lines are mutually parallel. Slow flow is taking place and the each fluid particle is moving along straight lines which are parallel to each other. In case of a turbulent flow, this is not the case, the flow lines will be non parallel, eddies can form, vortices can develop, that is the case of the turbulent flow regime. And Re within 1 to 10 means it is neither perfectly laminar nor perfectly turbulent. So, some turbulence is generated over here. So, the flow pattern whether it is laminar, transitional or turbulent does not alone depend on density or velocity or the diameter of the tube or the viscosity of the fluid, but a parameter such as this Re. So, now we are in a good position to initiate the principles of analog modeling 1G and for the ductile deformation. As per the pi theorem, there has to be a geometric similarity between prototype, I will tell you what is prototype and the model. Instead of similarity, you can also use the word similitude. As per pi theorem, the second requirement will be the dynamic similarity between the prototype and the model and the third is called the 
kinematic similarity has to be established between the prototype and the model. These three are coming from the pi theorem. What is the meaning of the word prototype? What is a model? A small piece of clay that we are deforming in the laboratory to mimic that shear zone, that deformation, some folded terrain, that is the model. So, it is a real rock that has been deformed, that is prototype. Model is the clay material or PDMS which we are deforming in the laboratory. Now, let us try to understand what it means when we say there has to be a geometric similarity. Let us say this is your prototype. This is your study area, the prototype is 30 kilometer and this is does not look like 60, but I will make it 60. So, let us say this is 60 kilometer A, B, C and D. A, B, C, D is your terrain, the prototype where the length is 60 kilometers, the width is 30 kilometers some deformation has taken place which we want to simulate in the laboratory. Now, I cannot have a 60 kilometer long clay layer and 30 kilometer width to run the model in the laboratory. I need certainly a smaller version. So, to do that the geometric similarity has to be maintained. So, what has to be done is that I can take a rectangular piece of clay and I have to choose A, B and B, C length in such a manner that so this is a prototype and this is the model. Okay. Choose A, B and B, C length in such a way What is that? A B by A B length, A B by A B length is equal to B C length divided by small b c length. So, what it means? So, if I take A B length as 12 centimeter, the B C length you see here it is B C length is half of A B length. So, I will take half of that. So, it will be 6 centimeter. So, now you can see capital A B by small a b is equal to capital B C by small b c has been maintained. Once it is done, this model is geometrically similar with the prototype. So, one can also write this equation if you want. it is all the same. So, this was establishing a geometric similarity between the prototype and the model. Try to understand that A B length on which we have no control, nature has created it. B C length we have no control, nature has created it, but we have full control on small A B length and on small B C length, because those are that is a clay layer. I can chop with a knife and I can get a suitable length ratio. Okay. So, this was about the two dimensional case where the geometric similarity is maintained. So, this can be called as a 2 D case. Just like the 2 D case, we can also have a three dimensional case. Let us say your study area is not just length and width, but there is also a depth involved. Say the geophysicists are talking also about a depth certain structures in the prototype. Then instead of the rectangle, I have to think of a cuboid. So, this is capital A length, this is capital B length and this is capital C length. So, how to maintain and this is our prototype. Now, in the model, what we need to do? We cannot again have kilometer long 
length, width, etc. in the clay layer. So, I need a smaller dimension A, B and C in such a way that this is maintained. We have no control on capital A B cap and capital C lens, whereas we have full control in the laboratory on small a, small b and small c length. We can choose the clay layer. Let us say A length is say 20 kilometer, let us say B length is 10 kilometer, let us say C length is I put 10 kilometer, though not in the diagram. In diagram C is much smaller than B anyway. So, this is your B. I can take this as let us say 20 centimeter, I can take this as 10 centimeter, C I can take as 10 centimeter. So, now you can see 20 kilometer by 20 centimeter equal to 10 kilometer by 10 centimeter equal to 10 kilometer by 10 centimeter. So, it is maintained. You can take also some other lengths here, then also it is possible. Let us say you choose for some reason instead of these numbers, let us say you take 18 centimeter, then naturally you can say B length will be half, you see here 20 and 10, that is half the length. So, it will be 9 centimeter and this length C will be 9 centimeter. Okay. Now, the question is what length should I take? Should I take a clay layer which is 1 centimeter length A, then it is too small, I cannot observe the deformation. Should I take a very big clay layer? Not permitted. In the laboratory, there is limited space. Let us say tabletop experiment. On this table, we are running the experiment. So, reasonably, say 18 centimeter is good, 20 centimeter is good. On a table, we can place the things. I will not take 200 centimeter. I will not take 1 centimeter. Even after taking 1 centimeter, I can find out geometrically similar B and C values, but then things become so small that the deformation is not visible. 